I want to give you the behavioural bias that sets the tone within which we respond to crisis and actually karma times too. And it's called situational blindness. It's a well-known psychological phenomenon that you pay attention to what's in front of you because it's important because it's in front of you. And you're not paying attention to what substantively matters that's going on around you. Now, this has been, we've been alerted to this in a number of environments for many decades. The most prominent example comes from the airline industry. Many more planes crashed than would otherwise have been the case when pilots were taking off without co-pilots, for example. Right now, you see that's a pretty obvious thing. But they were situationally blind to the importance of a co-pilot. What they were doing was they were checking whether the instruments were on, the engines were running, and forgot to pay attention to something that's substantively important. You see it in surgical operating theatres, where often they'd operate on the wrong patient, give them the wrong hip, and do all sorts of things that checklists fundamentally overcome. That's the first thing, first simple thing. Checklists draw you away from situational blindness. They remind you of what's fundamentally important when you're making a policy decision. Imagine if we'd had a checklist in you know, January, February, March, whatever, last year, that maybe even only had a half a dozen things on it. It doesn't have to be a very extensive, long list of items. What if it had on it the economic impacts? What if it had on it the impact on young people? What if it had on it the impact on, now, what is it, 135,000 children missing from school, right? Now, of course, some of those, many of those will be kids that are anxious and scared and are home um, schooling, but not all of them. Probably about half of them have literally gone missing. Literally gone missing. We don't know where they are and they're not in nice places, right? Having those items on a checklist, leave all the cost benefits to one side for a moment, that would have led to better policy. And actually, for those that might be interested in my own personal story with this, that's what concerned me the moment I woke up, lockdown was announced the following day, was all the kids in my own, you know, uh, I've got a 13 and 12-year-old kid uh, now, the people in their school who were being sent into vulnerable homes where they really shouldn't be spending very much time at home. Where were the voices around the decision-making table? We still might have made the same decisions. That's really important to make that clear, right? I don't know. It's a world of, it's a world of uncertainty. Who knows what to do? But we do need to have proper genuine diversity of experience, perspective and expertise around the, the, the actual table. And you're absolutely right, so just to emphasise again, it's not the role of epidemiologists to tell us that schools should close or should stay open or whether we should have 10pm curfews. It's a role for them to advise on transmission risks and hospitalisations and deaths. But that alone, this has been a health, economic and social crisis for which we needed a health, economic and social consideration um, and a process by which those kinds of decisions were made. So that's, that's, that's to reinforce what, um, what has been said, because fundamentally situational blindness is a bias that we will not overcome unless we properly embed the right processes in order to overcome it. Um, now on the, I feel like I, I, I feel compelled to say something about the impact assessments and the CBA, because I have actually in one way or another, I've sort of bounced around a lot in my academic life as I get bored with things. Um, but for all, all, almost all of those 30 years in one way or the other, I've been concerned about how you measure the stuff that people really care about but doesn't get bought and sold in markets. So we care about clean air, we care about health impacts, we care about social interaction, we care about all these things that we don't directly trade, that we can't put a monetary value on directly. And there are now techniques and methods that we can use in order to monetize or value at least in the first instance some of those effects. I mean, actually, fundamentally, it's actually quite straightforward. We care about two things. We care about how long we live and we care about how well we live. Life goes better when it's longer and better. So, obviously, we would want some kind of metric that both captures increases in life expectancy and improvements in life experience. We now have metrics to do that. I spent a lot of my early academic life generating quality adjusted life years that are now being used by NICE. They're only a partial picture. They only give you the health impacts. Well-being adjusted life years give us the opportunity to account for the well-being changes more completely. The fact that people have spent, many people have spent the last 18 months isolated, which actually, by the way, you don't even need to care about well-being to care about that. If you were ranking health interventions according to their impacts on life expectancy, 
loneliness is right near the top. It's up there with smoking and diet and exercise are way down the list. So even if you only cared about life expectancy, which would be on your checklist, presumably, then you would care about isolating people for so long. So expressing these impacts is possible in a single metric, and I can talk some more about that later if people want to pick up on that, uh, using well-being adjusted life years. The thing I will add about that is over the lifetime. I am an egalitarian who cares about the distribution of well-being over the lifetime. I want you to have as long a life as possible and as good a life as possible. And the less of that you have, or the less of that you can expect, the greater priority you should be for public policymakers. But think about what we've done over the last 18 months, is that we've inflicted significant damage and harm on those people whose life expectancies and life experiences were short in the first place, and will now be even shorter as a result. We have, we have done basically the biggest Robin Hood in reverse that you could imagine, I think. We have literally taken from those that have the least to give to those that have already had the most. And we see that writ large across public policy. This, isn't, this, is, this is just a magnification, actually, of what we see quite broadly and widely. So, but as I say, it's not enough to, to do these. You know, you know that the Treasury has the Green Book guidance, right? 150 pages of it. It's a wonder no one reads it. Um, but, you know, that should, every time there's a policy, we should actually go through the Green Book. No one pays any attention to it because it's not embedded in law, which is why we need something like this Public Health Act. We also need fora that really do genuinely bring together, just to restate it, different experiences, expertise, different perspectives, to properly discuss and debate these issues. I've been really struck, struck over this. I think we've got groupthink as a title, have we? Yeah. So it's been extraordinary to me over the last 18 months that I've felt like quite an academic loner. Um, well, I do anyway, but... Uh, <laughs> And not like most academics at LSE, but in any event, intellectually I felt quite alone when so many people have been so certain about what our policy response should be. How the fuck anybody could know what we should do? Uncertainty, by its very nature, would lead to different perspectives, opinions, and argument and discussion, and we've had hardly any. And that is, that is a, a, in the academy. I mean, you kind of ex might expect it amongst, you know, politicians, but in the academy, <laughs> where we should be looking at good evidence. And it's been extraordinary how little we have. Um, and on the diversity point, just to, just, to, just to make one further point on that, is if you think about all the decision makers and their advisors, not just here, but around the world, they're probably our ages, plus or minus a few years, nearly all of whom work in the public sector, nearly all of whom can work at home on full salaries and full pensions, nearly all of whom actually have quite nice houses, nearly all of whom are shit scared of dying. And that's really important. I make that as a really serious point because one of the, one of the few robust findings we get from happiness research is a U-shape in age. For those of you that are young or old, Actually, those that are old, you can be thankful that you're actually getting happier. The young people, you're going to have a midlife crisis. Now, this is actually, this is, this is well established across pretty much every data set around the world. You sort of dip into your 40s, and then by the time you get to Steve's age, my age, I'm a little bit older than him, um, we start getting happier, and then you get happier and happier until the last few months of your life, which can be pretty shit. Um, but, the early, but the early years... You're going to go into this dip. Now, that, now that, this is a well-established finding, which, which is really suggestive of something quite basic and primal. You actually find it in monkeys in zoos, where the zookeepers rate the happiness of the primates, and they have a midlife crisis as well. Now, I suspect that that midlife crisis, and this is some research that we're now starting, is heavily related to existential dread. Right? When you're young, you don't think about dying because why would you going to live forever? When you're older, you've come to terms with the fact that you haven't got another 50 years. When you're in mid-years, in midlife, that's the point at which it really hits you. And so just think then about some of the policy decisions we've made that have been through the lens of, and again, I, I want to be absolutely clear, we might still have made the same decisions, but had we had different perspectives and voices in the room when we're making them, we would at least be confident 
that that diversity was being accounted for. Shall I shut up? I reckon so. I reckon so. I re so just to, so, so I, I feel like I should do some summary after I've done my stream of consciousness. Um, the, oh, I will say something about the public inquiry then, maybe just as, just, just as a final point, because I'm not at all confident that the public inquiry will consider any of these issues, right? I mean, obviously, I kind of, you know, would defer to, to those who will know more about this than I do, but I, I have a very strong suspicion that the public inquiry will be focused almost entirely on deaths from COVID. And that will be a real missed opportunity. We need to ensure that that public inquiry asks some of the questions that we're all talking about today, that when we next face the next crisis, which we will, there'll be something else coming along, that we deal with it better and smarter. Thank you. Thank you.